all looking back at 20 years of Iraq, all of it's really been propaganda. Iraq is not a better place today. And let's not forget, the Iraqis are still paying for the American invasion today. 20 years ago, in March 2003, the US launched an invasion of Iraq, promising to end the rule of President Saddam Hussein and destroy all alleged weapons of mass destruction in the oil-rich country. I'm sure you guys all remember this. Today, 20 years on, Saddam Hussein is gone. 200,000 Iraqis have lost their lives and the country remains in a complete mess, deeply scarred, the economy is devastated and the government is marred with sectarian battles. America's reputation is at rock bottom after this and the war left a dark mark on America's global position. I have Adnan Khan, the founder of Geopolity, to help break down this for us today. How are you keeping Adnan? I'm very well, thank you. So let's begin with the million dollar question. With everything we know, why did the US invade Iraq in the first place? What, what was it trying to achieve? So Yusuf, for most people, the Iraq invasion in 2003, it started with the liberation of Kuwait back in 1991. I think it's important here that we need to understand that America really had its eyes on Iraq well before that. America from World War II was shaping the Middle East. It was looking to change the architecture that France and Britain had set up. America's first actual coup attempt was actually in 1963 in Iraq. However, you find by 1968 there was another coup that got rid of the, the coup plotters. And really from that point onwards, what you see is Iraq throughout the 1970s emerge as a very powerful nation. With the oil crisis in 1973, Iraq received huge revenues from its uh, oil exports. And by 1979, when Iraq, when Saddam Hussein took over, really Iraq was a regional power. So you find that when Iraq and Iran went to war between 1980 and 1988, America should supported both sides. It was in American interest that Iraq was weakened, and that's where Iran was very useful. On the other hand, America didn't want Iran to be the regional power as well. That's why you find officials saying it was in America's interest that neither Iraq or Iran won the wars, but they were drained and they were uh, weakened. Then obviously you find that Iraq invaded Kuwait in August 1990. And interestingly, before the invasion of Kuwait, America actually gave Saddam Hussein assurances that it won't interfere in its quarrel with Kuwait. The US ambassador at the time, April Gillespie, she actually conveyed the message to Saddam Hussein that the US had no opinion on Iraq's future intention with regards to Kuwait. But what you find very quickly, America built a coalition to go and liberate Kuwait. Really, what America did is it saw an opportunity to expand its military bases and influence in the Gulf region. And the Gulf region was full of energy resources as well. And these energy resources have, for a long time, America had its eyes on them. So you find throughout the 1990s, after the liberation of Kuwait, the US military, the defense establishment, the energy companies, and the right wing, they all began planning for Iraq's occupation. You find throughout the 1990s, various individuals that would go on to become household names, they were writing reports talking about regime change in Iraq. So the first of this was a document by Dick Cheney, who was the Secretary of Defense in 1992. He wrote a report, Peace Through Strength, in which he talked about expanding America's military presence in the Gulf region. And you saw various reports all culminating in 2000 with the project of the New American Century, which was the neocons, who wrote a report about expanding America's influence in the region, using its problem with Iraq to change unfavorable regimes. And this document was actually revealed to us by one of the American newspapers. And what it really showed is that the Bush administration had been planning for military control over the Gulf for many, many years, with or without Saddam Hussein in power. The report actually says the United States has for decades sought to play a more permanent role in the Gulf regional security, while the unresolved conflict with Iraq provides the immediate justification for substantial American force presence in the Gulf. So really, the reason why America invaded is because it had its eyes on Iraq, it had its eyes on the Gulf region for decades before, and Saddam Hussein in Iraq became the justification or the means to actually achieve this. That's really the reason why they invaded. It's a very interesting point you make, Adnan, because obviously this was 20 years ago. I was, I was actually still in high school at the time, 
And the way I remember it is 9-11 happened and then you had the uh, Iraq invasion not long after. And so for me, it was always connected to 9-11. But now you're saying that it had nothing to do with 9-11. Is that what I'm understanding? Yes, yeah, so that's quite an interesting point you make, Yusuf, because the neocons actually made a big effort to link 9-11 with the invasion of Iraq. Actually, they had no link because if you take your mind back, 9-11 happened and majority of the hijackers were Saudi and apparently they were backed by Osama bin Laden. And that was why the invasion of Afghanistan happened. But people seem to forget that. What you find is very quickly they started pointing fingers to Saddam Hussein, Iraq, Iraq supporting 9-11, things like that. What the neocons very successfully did, you said, was they framed the invasion of Iraq as an extension of the war on terror. And the war on terror was a response to 9-11. So people muddle this all up. They muddle 9-11, Iraq and Afghanistan all up. But actually, they're very different. As I mentioned, America had their eyes on Iraq going back a couple of decades. And really, since the first division in well, the, the, the liberation of Kuwait, really, this was on the table. It was just a matter of when will America actually do this. So you find throughout the 1990s, America's got no Soviet Union anymore. Communism's dead. America is opening up the world via globalization. And what you find is the drums of war are starting, the propaganda war starting against Iraq and Saddam Hussein. In fact, the decade after 1991, America used sanctions, the UN, to really weaken Iraq for when they eventually invade, Iraq really couldn't defend the country. So Iraq actually had nothing to do with 9-11. All the claims that were made have been proven to be lies. And in origin, the neocons actually never argued about 9-11 and Iraq. What they did do was muddy the waters so people would link them two together. And that they probably did quite successfully, actually. So why were the neocons so fixated on Iraq in the first place? Right. So 1991, when the Soviet Union collapsed, there was a lot of thinking within America's elite uh, politicians, all the think tanks on how America will utilize this opportunity now to ensure America remains the power going forward. So there was quite a few views on how America can use its power and make sure the 21st century is also the American century as well. And really the dominant school of thought that came to dominate American thinking and the administration was the neocons. And their view was is the 20th century was the American century and the 21st century also has to be the American century as well. So the way that was going to be achieved was by expanding American power. America was head and shoulders above everybody else. It had the largest military, the largest navy, the largest air force. So they did view American power from a security lens, from a military lens. And their view was, is that the best use of America's power, so American power includes many things, it includes Hollywood, it includes culture, it includes economics. But their view was that the best use of American power was to create regime change of unfavorable regimes. So Iraq was going to be their first experiment. And obviously, as we know, it turned into a complete uh, disaster. So the neocons were fixated on Iraq because firstly, it's been on their minds decades before. And for them, Iraq was part of the bigger jigsaw of expanding America's influence around the world now that there was no more opposition because the Soviet Union had gone. So knowing all this now, what was the strategy that the US had in place for Iraq and why did it go so wrong? Okay, so the specific strategy was, is firstly, it evolved over time as things developed and as they got things wrong. So the original strategy was that they would conduct an invasion and overthrow the regime. And that was actually achieved within about a month. And then they would establish a new compliant regime and they would stabilize it. And that regime would basically be loyal to America. It would give America contracts and it would basically be a forward base for America in the region, much like Israel is today. But this is where the problems began because Iraq is an Israel. Iraq can stand on its own feet. It doesn't need a foreign patron like Israel does. So what you find is the Iraqi people began an insurgency against the invading forces. And very quickly, America began starting, she started to bleed to death due to the uh, insurgency. Now, one of the main problems why it went horribly wrong is the 
US forces were actually fighting the same war they fought in 1991. In 1991, America used conventional troops to fight a conventional army, the Iraqi army. America made use of precision bombings. And effectively, America used all its strengths against the Iraqi forces. In 2003, America conducted the same war again. However, its war was really was against insurgency. So you're not fighting a conventional army now. You're fighting unconventional forces. You don't have a center of gravity. You don't have long supply lines. And this is what America struggled with in the end. So America's enemy, the insurgency, was faceless. It was leaderless. And it had no center of gravity. And this is why America was really bleeding to death. And a similar thing really took place in Afghanistan as well. So what you find in... 1991, they were fighting against fighter jets. They were fighting against missiles. This time, they were fighting against insurgent attacks, IEDs. They were conducting surges. They were conducting assassination. This became the norm. And really, the fact that Afghanistan began to fall apart in 2005, that didn't help the Iraqi occupation as well. So, as we know now, uh, what took place in Afghanistan is exactly what took place in Iraq. But Iraq actually was far worse and far more important to America. So uh, I guess the question is, how did the U.S. adapt to all this? Obviously, it didn't go to plan. What did they do? So America dealt with this in three ways. Firstly, and interestingly, it enlisted the help of regional nations and not just Turkey in the northern areas. It actually engaged Syria and Iran. What you find, Yusuf, is in about 2005 or six, America asked two senators. It was a bipartisan report the Baker-Hamilton report, which looked at the situation in Iraq and how they could fix it. And the conclusion it came to was America is now marred in insurgency that can't win. And what it proposed was, interestingly, that the surrounding countries like Syria and Iran, we can work with them on this select issue. So what you find is when America was beaten to death, it turned to Syria and Iran to come and save the day. Interestingly, Iran actually reached out to America when it invaded. They wanted to actually join it because Iran has had quite difficult relations with Saddam Hussein and Iraq as well. But the neocons said, no thanks, uh, we got this, we don't need you. And uh, what you find very quickly though, they had to turn to the regional nation. So Iran and Syria actually played a very central role to stabilizing Iraq, which actually saved America in the end. So that was the first one, and listen the help of regional nations. The second way was America divided the insurgency through playing on the ethno-sectarian divisions. So you find there was a period of time for about five years where Sunni and Shia got together and they were fighting a leading insurgency against America who was bleeding to death. So you find the Kurds joined America from the beginning in the north. In the south of the country with the Shia, they led an insurgency. And in the center of the country, uh, the Sunnis led an insurgency against uh, America. And what you find was very quickly, Sunni and Shia fighting together against America turned into bombs gang off in Shia mosques, bombs gang off in Sunni mosques, and the Sunni and Shia turning against each other. Sunni and Shia fighting each other, they are no longer fighting uh, America. And then the final strategy of America was they constructed a political process with the help of various opportunists, corrupt groups, and individuals and groups from Iran. So one of the key things Iran did was it got all its groups in the south of uh, Iraq that are linked to Iran. It got them to join America's political process when it set up the government in 2004, 2005. So what that meant was all the groups that were leading an insurgency against America, they put their weapons down and they joined the political process. And in fact, they, were, they, they ran the government for many, many years afterwards. So that's how America adapted. America enlisted the help of regional nations. It divided the insurgency by using ethno-sectarian card, and then it constructed a political process and co-opted groups that were linked to Iran. And that's really how they were able to take the wind out of the insurgency. Uh, we don't actually hear much about Iraq these days. Where do things stand now? I mean, we had ISIS was quite big in Iraq. Obviously, things have calmed down there. Yeah, what's going on in Iraq now? So, 20 years on, uh, Yusuf, People are not talking about Iraq because there's nothing good to talk about. No one's talking about Iraq today, especially America, because there's actually nothing good to uh, talk about. Uh, things have really gone from bad to worse in Iraq. So 2011, the U.S. formally ended its mission in Iraq. I think the U.S. still has a very small contingent there, but it's as good as not having any troops there. So that was in 2011. Then in 2014, a bunch of guys who were imprisoned in Camp Bakr, 
which is on the outskirts of Baghdad. They were in an American prison and somehow, whether they were released or not, they ended up establishing ISIS and ended up conquering large tracts of Iraq and obviously the most famous was Mosul. And this period is very, very suspect to you. So as I mentioned, all of the founders of ISIS were in American prisons for a significant period of time. And all of a sudden they uh, get together and establish a group that will go on to conquer large tracts of the region. But the political process in America set up, what you find is sectarian politics, the sectarian breakdown of the country, which America established, has led to very ineffective governments. It's led to a frequent change of governments. Security remains a big issue even now. But the, probably the biggest issue is corruption. And, you know, we've seen rulers removed in Iraq because of this. So after America's decade-long invasion, the invasion was bad enough for the people, but the system America left behind has been far worse. And in fact, it's no different to what we're seeing in Afghanistan. Oh, well, for a quick fire round, first of all, the, there was a lot of arguments put on the media propaganda to justify the invasion. With what we know now, I just want to review these arguments and, and see what we think about them. So first one, the, the invasion, it was justified because the UN agreed to it. The UN had all their resolutions in place. Yeah, so this was a central argument at the time. You surf people or politicians, Tony Blair, George W. Bush, Condoleezza Rice, they all kept arguing that this has a legal backing of the UN resolution. So United Nations Security Council Resolution 1441 was the resolution they used. And that resolution, it basically argued that a previous UN resolution had been breached where Iraq wasn't allowed to pursue a WMD program. What we now know is America pressured many of the nations at the UN, effectively bribed them to make sure they vote in America's, with the way America wanted. And obviously we now know there were no WMDs, it was all a lie, you know, uh, they lied. Donald Rumford famously said they are there, but we can't find them. And, you know, it just looked very damning and very silly uh, on America. So the UN resolution, America would have gone in even without a UN resolution. This was just a propaganda argument because many people try to use a legalistic argument. But in the end, it didn't really matter. And in fact, it was all a lie in the end anyway. A 40 nation coalition that invaded Iraq. Yeah, so it wasn't just one or two countries. Uh, with so much of the world that supported the invasion, that actually gave it legitimacy. Yeah, again, the use of the neocons try to use this argument, but like with all these arguments, if you scrutinize them, scratch beneath the surface, you find they don't quite uh, add up. Yes, there was a 40 nation coalition. And I think overall, on average, you had about 200,000 troops in Iraq for most of the invasion. But when we break it down, what you find, there wasn't really 40 nations in Iraq. There was really one nation that dominated it. So as I mentioned, there was around 200,000 troops for the majority of the period. 170,000 troops alone were from America. 47,000 troops, this is getting an order of number of troops, was the UK. That's a big difference from the 170k America Center. The third highest number of troops was from Australia, and that was 2,000 troops only. Then it was Poland with 1,700. So really what you find, this was not a 14 nation coalition. This was one big nation and they needed someone to carry the weapons. They needed someone to clean the facilities. And that's where the other troops came in. So really, although there were 40 nations involved, really there wasn't. There was one unilateral power, which was America. And the West, the rest were just dragged along uh, with them. Some crazy figures actually. What about this one? You had many Muslim countries Muslim nations that also supported the invasion. Uh, how would you argue that? This was actually quite interesting, Yusuf, because um, this was the justification used. And what we find, although the Muslim rulers supported this, the Muslim mass didn't. And in fact, Turkey was offered, I think, nearly close to 30 billion for America to use Turkish facilities to invade. But the Turkish government had to turn it down because in 1991, Many people believed Saddam Hussein deserved it. Uh, he deserved it because of how brutal he was. By 2003, most of the Muslim world viewed the American invasion as, an, as a war against Islam. They didn't, see, they didn't see action as a war against Saddam Hussein. They saw it as a war against the Iraqi people, a war against Muslims, and the war against Islam. And in fact, the hatred and the low public opinion of America in the Muslim world, a lot of it actually goes back to the Iraqi invasion. 
So the Muslim nations, the rulers, sorry, have always supported America. Their challenge has been, how do you balance this with the mass public opinion, which is against America? So this isn't really a positive argument for America. The, the Muslim rulers absolutely supported it because really they lackeys for America. The mass didn't support it. And that's why you find many Muslim rulers have actually struggled uh, after the Iraq war. Well, it's seen as, um, it, it's seen as uh, the, the Muslim rulers supported America against Muslims. So famously, because Musharraf supported America in Afghanistan, he's famously known as Musharraf uh, at that part of the world. One one argument that was thrown around that I remember 20 years ago was that Saddam Hussein, he was actually a very bad ruler. He was a, a brutal ruler who killed and tortured a lot of his people, especially the Kurds. Uh, now, how much truth is there in that? So many laugh at this now. In fact, many did laugh at it at the time uh, as well. No doubt Saddam Hussein was a brutal ruler. But when he was a brutal ruler, it was America that supplied him with the gas that he used to gas the Kurds. It was America that was providing him with weapons in the war against Iran. So at one time, he was a good leader. He was a good, bad leader. Then all of a sudden, he became a really, really bad leader and he needs to be invaded. And the inconsistency is so blatant because in Myanmar, the military regime has oppresses people you don't see an invasion. North Korea oppresses its own people. There's not been an invasion. Sri Lanka oppresses its own people. You didn't see an invasion. Many, many African rulers oppressed their people. You didn't see an invasion. So now this is very obvious to people that, you know, the, you know, America is going to go in and it's just using this against Saddam uh, Hussein. The problem was obviously at the time the propaganda was so aggressive. Many people who didn't understand the relative of Iraq felt, in fact, many people who supported the war now have turned against it. Their view was if I knew then what I knew now, I would never have supported it. So there, this argument was laughable. You know, Saddam Hussein needed to be removed. He was a brutal ruler who killed and tortured his people. Of course he did. No one's denying that. But many rulers have done that, but they've not been on the receiving in the regime change. Um, and this is a famous one, which I'm sure everyone remembers. The war on terror was necessary to deal with the scourge of terrorism. That was all we heard back in them, them days. Yes, war against terror was really all we heard in the 2000s. It was a justification for everything. You know, whoever you are, wherever you are, you terrorists, you can't hide America's uh, coming for you. But what we find is of so the war on terror, it didn't actually reduce terrorism, it actually increased terrorism. Terrorism today is far worse. In fact, terrorism before 9-11 were acts of violence in certain parts of the world due to political issues that were going on. What we found though is terrorism then spread across the world. It came to the West as well. In fact, attacks in the West have grown now because of the war on terror. And more importantly, Yusuf, there was no ISIS before the war on terror. ISIS will be the legacy of the war on terror. The war on terror created ISIS. So America's war on terror, rather than reducing terrorist attacks, rather than making the world safer, it made it even uh, worse. And that's why for many people, America framed the war on terror as America the good guy fighting the terrorist the bad guy. Many in the world just see America as another terrorist state. They don't see this terrorists around the world and America. What they see, there's many terrorists around the world. America is one of them. So really, 20 years on, the war on terror really is laughable. However, for the people who are victims to it, they're having to live by the outcome of it. And last one for you, Adnan. The, the Sunni-Shia conflict is a source of tension in the region and there had to be some intervention to actually deal with this. Yeah, so this was a, another argument that was, used. obviously Iraq is majority Shia, and then you've got uh, minority Sunnis and Kurds. So despite the Shia being a majority, the ruler was obviously Sunni. So again, very black and white, this is how they sold the war, that the Sunni and Shia are each other's throats, and because they're each other's throats, we have to intervene, and only we can intervene and stop this from happening. Now, the belief that the Sunni-Shia disagreements are source of continuous conflict in the Muslim world isn't new. This has been a justification for the last 100 years to interfere in the Muslim world. But the reality was, for most part, when America invaded, Sunni and Shia fought together against the US. Really, the source of conflict in Iraq was the foreign invasion by America. They're the foreigners. They were the problem, and they were the target of the insurgency because they're the foreign invaders. On the whole, the Sunni and Shia conflict was very small and actually America tried to pour fuel over it 
in order for the insurgency to stop against America. So you're right, once again, the Sunni Shia was used. All of these arguments you find, Yusuf, as America struggled in Iraq, as its arguments became clear that they were based on Finney and America was lying, they tried to resort to other arguments. And the Sunni Shia argument was something that they resorted to. But even think tanks from America, I think near the end of the war, they said 70 to 80% of attacks in Iraq actually take place by Iraqis against American troops. Um, only a minority of attacks were between Sunni or Shia between Iraqi to Iraqi. So really, again, this was another propaganda angle. And really, the whole looking back at 20 years of Iraq, all of it's really been propaganda. Iraq is not a better place today. Uh, many American soldiers lost their lives. They didn't know what they were fighting for. And now many are really upset when they see that really their own people, their own boys, their, 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 their brother, their sisters, their parents who fought in the Iraq war, they fought for a war that was built upon a few people in America who believed it was in America's interest to expand its influence around the world and invade this country. And unfortunately, they've had to pay. And let's not forget, the Iraqis are still paying for the American invasion today. Uh, thanks for clarifying all those points for us, Adnan. Very insightful, actually. If you want to learn more about the issues we've raised today, please check out our website, www.thegeopolicy.com. You can also learn more on other issues by accessing our website. You'll find comprehensive insights, analysis, articles, deep dives. Thank you for listening. Mm -hmm.